Let's start with Darwin's biography and then learn about his theory of natural selection and then his major contributions to psychology. Darwin was born in England to wealthy parents. His mother was an heir to a business that made pottery in China. As an adolescent, he was described as smart, but also spoiled and aimless. At the time, his parents were afraid that he would never accomplish anything, that he would grow up living in their house for the rest of his life. In college, Darwin first studied medicine, but when he transferred to Cambridge University, he became interested in the natural sciences. He was mentored by both a botanist and a geologist and really just fell in love with biology, geology, which eventually would lead him to study evolution. His interest in biology and geology led him to join a group of researchers as they traveled to South America on the HMS Beagle. This is an illustration of that ship that Darwin spent 57 months traveling aboard. He was seasick the entire time when they would stop at different locations along South America's coast, he was relieved to get off the boat and got to work as soon as they set foot on land. The ship was only 90 feet long and 24 feet wide. It held 70 passengers and they traveled for nearly five years from 1831 to 1836. He is most famous for the work he did in the Galapagos Islands, but he looked at animals and plant species all over the South American coast. Plus, he had no idea that what he was doing at the time would land him in nearly every history book in the country. When the crew would stop at different locations, Darwin would get off of the boat and just explore the area. He took with him a journal and took more than 2,000 pages of notes throughout his trip. He looked at plants, animals, the geography, the geology. He looked at the, the formation of land as well as the content of that land. He ended up cataloging 1,500 different species. He collected over 4,000 bones, fossils, and dried specimens. He then spent the next 20 years, the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, he spent 20 years trying to explain what he had observed, what he had collected, what he had witnessed on his trip. In trying to catalog the species he was finding, he would draw them in notebooks. This is one of his earliest catalogs of the species he found in South America. While he was away in South America, he sent specimens home to England for his colleagues to review. While he was gone, he became uber famous. So famous that by the time he returned in 1836, Every zoologist, botanist, geologist, geographer, everyone knew who Charles Darwin was. But can you imagine? He had no idea. When he stepped off the boat in England, he had no idea that everyone knew who he was because he had been away in South America. But those specimens that he shipped home helped make him famous before he even returned. The image shows Darwin's actual finches. You can see the tags on their feet. They were written by Charles Darwin. Once he was home, he was able to start working on his theory and testing some of his ideas. One of the things he noticed was that finches on different islands looked differently. Some finches had short, blunted, tough beaks, strong beaks. On some of the other islands, the finch's beaks were longer, thinner, weaker. He also took notes about the environment. On some of the islands, the trees had nuts, fruits, and other vegetation. On the other islands, there weren't as many trees, but there were plenty of insects, worms, and grubs. 
He reasoned that the physical differences between the finches' beaks were related to the differences in their homes, in their environment. Over time, the beaks had evolved, adapted, changed to better suit the animal. On the islands with nuts and fruit, the finches' beaks were short and strong. It's easier to crack a nut if you have a strong device to open it with. It's easier on the islands with insects, worms, grubs. It's easier to find that food if you have a long, thin beak that you can stick into tiny places where those insects hide. He believed that the beak adaptations allowed some birds to eat more, which means they have an opportunity to reproduce and pass on those characteristics of their advantageous beaks to the next generation of finches. Now that I've given you a preview, let's cover the basics of his theory of natural selection. There are five basic pillars that I'll cover in this lecture, and I'll use the illustration of the giraffes at the bottom of the screen to try to help explain these principles. The first pillar is that no two members of a species are exactly alike. In the leftmost example with the giraffe, you see four giraffe. They're all very different, different heights, different sizes. Pillar number two, members who have a variation, an adaptation that helps them survive in their environment are selected by nature to survive and reproduce. In the middle illustration, you see the two taller giraffe have been selected by nature because they're taller and able to reach the top of the trees for food. They've been selected by nature to survive. The two shorter giraffe have died because they don't have access to food. The third pillar is that these variations, these adaptations are then passed on to the offspring of the surviving members and the cycle of passing this adaptation on to the next generation, it continues in a cycle for as long as the variation is beneficial. You see in the third illustration on the right, the two taller giraffe have made a baby and that giraffe is also tall. Members of the species who do not have that adaptation do not survive and do not reproduce. Over many, many generations, more and more members of the species will have that adaptation for as long as it is beneficial. If the environment changes, if the weather changes, then the animals will need to adapt and change as well. In rare circumstances, some genes do not copy correctly and mutations result. These mutations result in variations, adaptations that are not beneficial to the animal. I have an example of a mutation in the image. We have a female giraffe and her offspring. You can see that he is missing stripes and right now has spots. This zebra will not change. It will not grow into its stripes. Baby zebras are born with stripes. This baby zebra has a mutation. And unfortunately, because he does not have stripes, it will be very difficult for him to blend into the savanna grasses and hide from predators. For this reason, mutations are not usually passed on to offspring because that animal doesn't survive and doesn't reproduce. Unfortunately, this baby zebra is probably no longer with us. Sometimes Darwin is associated with the phrase survival of the fittest. This phrase is not part of his theory of natural selection. He actually didn't come up with this phrase. It was coined by Herbert Spencer years later, who was inspired by Darwin's theory, but applied the theory of evolution to social situations. Darwin did not believe that an animal had to be the strongest 
it wasn't about strength. It was about adaptations. It was about having the best adaptation for your environment. So for some animals, yes, the strongest do survive, the fittest do survive. But for animals, it's the ones who are best camouflaged. It's the ones who have the best mating call. It's the ones who are able to hide from predators. It's not always about strength and finesse when it comes to Darwin's original theory of natural selection. Darwin had traveled to South America in the 1830s. He didn't publish his theory until 1859. He published it in On the Origin of the Species. A year before he published it, he received a letter from a man by the name of Alfred Wallace. Wallace had reviewed some of Darwin's notes and specimens, the pictures of his specimens, and begun to come up with his own ideas to explain Darwin's observations. This knowledge that someone else was working on a similar idea was enough to motivate Darwin to put the final touches on his theory and get it published. When he published his theory, the religious community resisted it. They were not a fan of his challenge to their traditional explanation, but the scientific community embraced it. And for decades, his theory would be one of the prominent forces in the natural sciences as well as in psychology. Now that we've learned about Charles Darwin and Wilhelm Wundt, I think it's time to make an important note. One of the themes in this class is that founders are promoters. The individuals who are associated with founding and creating and coming up with new ideas are usually those who promoted those ideas. Wallace had a similar idea. Maybe he even started working on it in the 1820s. But because Wallace didn't publish first, because he didn't get out there and promote his ideas like Darwin did, Wallace doesn't get credit. Darwin's theory of natural selection had a huge impact on the field of psychology. It influenced tests and measurements, the study of individual differences. It influenced comparative psychology, which looked at the similarities and differences both within a species of animal and across species of animals. So comparative psychologists would compare rats but they'd also compare rats with mice. Functionalism, which we'll talk about in a few weeks, was also heavily influenced by Darwin's ideas. The functionalists studied the functions of the mind and the functions of behaviors. Why do we think the way we do? Why do we behave the way that we do? Are these thoughts and behaviors somehow adaptive? Do they help us survive in some way? His ideas also influenced evolutionary psychology, which focuses on the forces that lead us to adapt and change our thoughts and behaviors. Years after he published his theory of natural selection, he began to study emotions. He had made connections with people all over the world. He surveyed many of these people that he had met during his travels. He asked them to describe or identify the emotions depicted in different illustrations. This image is one of Darwin's early sketches. He showed this image to some of his colleagues and asked them to identify the emotion being expressed in the image. What he found is that across the globe, across cultures, people tend to identify emotions similarly. Nearly every person he asked would identify this emotion as fear. Some people called it surprise, but no one said this man was happy. No one said this man was mad. Most people, regardless of where they lived on the planet, could identify emotions, the same emotions. He concluded then that emotional expression and emotional identification are universal. One of his greatest contributions was his influence on many of the other 
psychologists that we'll learn about in this class. I have a web here of all the different people that he influenced. He influenced a man by the name of Chauncey Wright. Wright wrote a lot about Darwin's ideas and then Wright met William James and Charles Pierce. William James then influences Hall, who influences Terman and Small and Cattell, and the list continues.